Okay. I am going to have us get started because we don't have a lot of time and we have a lot of exciting speakers today. We're actually going to have 13 people talking during the next 19, 90 minutes. So, oh, and myself, 14 people. All right, with that, before we get started, I wanted to draw your attention to the slide in front, noting that this session is being recorded uh, to facilitate note taking and Please let us know if you have any challenges or concerns with that. Thank you. And so my name is Jennifer Smith. Most of you probably saw me on stage earlier. I'm with the US Forest Service, and I'm happy to be here today representing our Silva Carbon Program, which is a US government interagency effort. Um, it's funded by the U.S. Agency for International Development and the U.S. Department of State with key implementation by the U.S. Geological Survey and the U.S. Forest Service uh, with collaboration from many other sister agencies as well. Um, over the last several years, ah, I wanted to point out that in this year alone, in 2023, Silver Carbon has close to 75 activities taking place across 32 countries, just to give you a scope of our program. Um, as a capacity building provider working in the realm of forest and carbon monitoring, several years ago, we noticed a, con a concerning trend, which was that most of the people coming to our trainings were men. And so we wanted to take a deliberate approach to addressing this concern. And that's what you'll be hearing about over the next 90 minutes. Um, we put together a variety of programs, a variety of ways to address this. Um, so we'll be talking about those today. We're going to start with some opening comments from the Associate Chief of the Forest Service. Uh, we will also hear from FAO Senior Forestry Officer, Amy Duchelle, and then We'll have three short presentations outlining Silva Carbon programs. We'll get to those in a moment. And after all of that, we're going to hear from eight panelists who have taken part in those programs. So excuse me if I feel like I'm rushing, but I am the least exciting person here. With that, I would like to turn it over to Associate Chief Coleman for some opening words. Climate. Thank you very much. That's helpful. <laughs> um, I first want to extend my deepest gratitude to uh, Global Forest Observation in Initiative, GFOI, and the Food and Agric Agriculture Organization, FAO, for hosting this Women and Climate Side event. But I'm especially excited to hear about the findings of the Gender Research Program and to meet the wonderful panelists from the Women in Climate Action, WICA, program and the Women in Forest Carbon Initiative mentorship pro program called WIFSI. I've learned these words overnight. <laughs> this side event provides an opportunity for us to champion all women in forest and carbon monitoring to, in in to increase their international experience, to build a global network and facilitate international exchange among professional counterparts from around the world. Just last week, I was talking about this session with a very close colleague of mine, Dr. Toral patel Wainin from the Forest Service. She's part of our R&D unit. She's a pioneer in this field of climate uh, within the Forest Service, and she's a woman of color uh, as well. Toro has fought hard and overcome many obstacles to get her voice and place at the table. And she was very happy to hear that we would be talking about that in this space. I too uh, have experienced a lack of support in the past. Uh, so seeing the results of programs such as WICA and WIFSI bring me great joy, inspiration, and frankly, hope as women play increasingly important and crucial roles in addressing our climate crisis. And last evening, I had the immense honor of dining with some of these incredible women from Cameroon and Gabon. They're breaking down barriers for their own countries against incredible odds. 
They shared their inspiring stories with me, and frankly, I'm full of their stories today, and I'm just grateful to see them here uh, in this row. In that same spirit, I think back to my own personal story early in my career in the Forest Service, when I was told as a 30-year-old early careerist that I had reached my highest potential as a communications officer in the Forest Service. Now, as one who loved our mission and the work we did to sustain forests and grasslands, I knew I could, I wanted to contribute more. But this moment was one of my biggest mental struggles with our agency. And it took me more than a year to come to terms with the pessimistic outlook that people had for my future, to motivate myself thanks to many other supporters and people who could see possibilities that I couldn't see to help me move past my limita the limitations imposed by others. And so it's quite profound and an irony that some 15 years later, I stand or sit here today as the associate chief of that same forest service. I'm an African-American woman, the first in over 100 years to hold this position. And I'm the second highest executive in this natural resource organization. Toward this end, I know what it means to be a woman and to not always have the support and advocacy necessary to move forward and confidently express a voice in critical dialogue that affects all of our futures. Which is why, I, why being here today is so meaningful and so important to me. Gender equity is critical to the work of the United States Forest Service and it is a key goal for both Chief Randy Moore and myself. Both of us have transcended and broken through racial and gender barriers. And it's this kind of consistent commitment to this work from many others that helped us break through. So our goal is to make sure there's room for many, many more at this table. Forest Service success depends on retaining a high performing performing representative and service fo focused workforce that can serve all people. The success and equity equitable delivery of our mission depends on employees who mirror the people we serve, appreciate our different cultures and traditions and build community and share stewardship with all citizens. And since the COVID-19 pandemic, our agency struggled to retain our employees, especially women. During this time, women were forced to make difficult choices to leave their employment behind to take care of their families. And this is a story many of us are familiar with. However, we often overlook it. Our agency is currently working hard to rebuild our recruitment efforts and focus on women and minority groups as we understand the importance and value and a diverse workforce bringing to the management of forests and conservation. All the work we do in the Forest Service would not be as impactful without the collaboration of our sister agencies. The United States Geological Survey conducted extensive research on women and the barriers they face as they consider their options, family commitments, and access to resources before embarking on their careers in the forest carbon monitoring and associated technical areas. As an avid learner and lifelong student, I'm looking forward to hearing about those findings. I have a feeling I'll be calling you afterwards. <laughs> Silva Carbon recognizes the importance of gender equality in forestry and has included gender mainstreaming as a cross-cutting issue in its programs. When women are empowered to participate in forest management and conservation, they bring valuable skills and knowledge to the table, and they often have a deep understanding of the local ecology and the needs of their communities and they are often more effective at engaging local people in conservation efforts. Women are also more likely to prioritize long-term health of the forest over short-term gains, which is critical for ensuring that forests are sustainably managed. As we work towards sustainable forest management and climate action, it is crucial to recognize and support women's contributions to this endeavor. The role of women in forests cannot be overstated. The work that each one of you do 
to support countries' efforts towards sustainable forest management and gender equity is admirable. It is inspiring. It also breaks barriers and shines a light on new possibilities for other women and girls and underrepresented groups. As global citizens, it is our responsibility to support such programs to achieve a sustainable and equitable future for all of us. It is also the responsibility of the leaders in the room that have broken down barriers to continue to lift up other women who are still struggling to break through. When all is said and done, all we want as human beings, all human beings, is to feel valued, to feel respected, to feel like we belong, and to know that our voice matters. The, move, the more we can do to help each other do that, the more our voices will be heard and the greater our impact will be. So I thank GFOI and FAO for hosting this important event. I thank and salute all the participants, panelists, and champions for women in forest and carbon monitoring. And let us continue to work together to support and empower women in this field. Thank you so much. Yeah, great. Well, yes. Mm -hmm. This is Amy Dukel. She's a senior forestry officer and team leader of forest and climate in FAO's forestry division. And we are excited to hear her remarks as well. Let me know when you want me to change the slides. Thank you, Jennifer. And it's an honor to be on this panel and sitting next to Angela Coleman. I thank you for those words. And it, it, your leadership is truly inspiring. So, so truly an honor to be here. Uh, welcome to FAO. We're just so happy to have this place filled with a bunch of forestry people. <laughs> because the F in FAO doesn't stand for forestry. It stands for food. So sometimes we want to you know, elevate more and more the, the importance of forests. Um, so today, I mean, just a few, I have a few brief slides, in fact, just to sh show how important gender considerations are, are to FAO's work on, on climate change. And, um, you know, this is the for, I'm, I'm speaking from FAO's forestry division, but I should say that for the organization as a whole, in our strategic framework, one of the program priority areas is focused on gender, and we have a gender mainstreaming approach that, that goes through all of the work that we do. And so this is a much broader institutional push um, across the entire organization. So next. For those of you who were at COP27, um, there was a lot of people there, and you may or may not have realized, but those who were actually in the negotiation rooms were fairly underrepresented in terms of female participation. It was something like 30% of the negotiators were, were women, and, and actually that's a good number when you look at the family photo that was taken of, of heads of state and, and ministers where, you know, there was very little representation by women. And some, a really important initiative that FAO has been spearheading, Fida Haddad is here, she can wave, um, is this We Can initiative. It's a community of practice that's bringing together women-led organizations from, from developing countries and actually got a bunch of negotiators and civil society participants at COP27 to make sure that those um, solutions were, were heard from, from people on the front lines of, of climate change. And um, I think it's really important to understand that we understand that women and rural women, indigenous women are particularly and uniquely vulnerable to the effects of climate change, but it's actually also that vulnerability that gives them the urgency of the solutions. And I think, you know, when we hear a lot about still climate denial, climate inaction, climate despair, that's often coming from a place of privilege. Those who say, actually, this isn't gonna affect me, so I'm not gonna do anything, or 
I can't do anything, it's too overwhelming, but those who actually are the most vulnerable can't say that. And, and actually that's why those solutions that are coming from that place of vulnerability are, are so very important. Next. We have a ton of forest and climate initiatives on the ground. Many of you know about the Red Plus work in the context of the UN Red Program, the UN Decade on Restoration, um, and, and really all of those. This is a photo from a, a, on the, the left, is a, from a photo from Honduras, where the Red Plus strategy with FAO support is all about empowering women and indigenous women and youth. And then on the right is a restoration project in, in Kenya where um, gender indicators are, are included in this from the very beginning. Next. And then of course we're at the GFOI, so I do need to say a few words about monitoring. I think there's two aspects of monitoring that are important that we are focused on. You know, one is actually just getting women into monitoring initiatives, as, as you were saying, Jennifer. I mean, so enhancing the participation, and we have a, a Jeff-led um, building global capacity to increase transparency in the forestry sector in the context of the enhanced transparency framework of, of the Paris Agreement, where, you know, all about capacity building in transparent monitoring, and 40% of the participation in that has been women. We also have our peatlands monitoring work in Indonesia where, again, 40% of those involved in that have been women, and that doesn't happen by chance. I mean, that's a very purposeful effort to get women involved in these monitoring efforts. And then there's a side of the indicators. So really ensuring that the indicators um, in monitoring are gender responsive, um, you know, that they can measure changes in gender dynamics over time. Um, finding synergies before, between different reporting obligations. I think that's a lot of the complaints that we've heard that, oh, you're adding a gender element into reporting. We have to do more monitoring, more reporting, but actually finding clever ways to, to align with, with other reporting frameworks so that, you know, folks can actually focus on implementation of gender responsive and gender transformative programs and focus less on the reporting and monitoring piece of it. So actually getting, getting the work done. Um, and one sort of re suggestion that came out of this project in Kenya was that the, the ministry responsible for gender and women's affairs could be a coordinating agency to ensure that this kind of um, alignment was taking place in the monitoring efforts. And then we get to my last slide which I had to include because of um, Angela's comments this morning on fire. Um, and this is a huge area of work for, for FAO. Um, huge challenges in terms of getting gender and integrated fire management. Um, we know that this is a field that's largely led by men. Uh, it's a hyper-masculine environment, especially when you get to the sort of the fire fighting front of things. I'm proud to say that there's one UN fire management officer in the entire system, and this person is based at FAO, and this person is Lara Steil, who's sitting in the front row <laughs> here. And um, I, I've been in many meetings with her, and it's, it's her and the guys, actually. <laughs> so she's really um, holding the fort. She, before coming to FAO, she led Brazil's um, fire management program for 16 years. So we're very lucky to have her um, as of a year ago. And I should say that what we're, we're initiating next week, there's a big international wildland fire conference happening in Portugal. FAO and UNEP will be launching a global fire management hub. And a key pillar of that hub is wildfire resilient communities. And components of that include indigenous and traditional knowledge, community-based fire management, gender equity, diversity, and inclusion. And we're hoping that the secretary for, for this initiative will be hosted at FAO. And we're actually using the GFOI model um, as an inspiration because it's so much about partners and so much about the many organizations that, that in the case of FIRE are, are coming to the table and, and we're hoping to really enhance the, the gender dimensions of that work. So thank you.
right, thanks everyone. I'm Krista Straub. I'm a social scientist with USGS. Uh, thanks for the great opening remarks to you both. Those were wonderful. I think you're gonna connect a lot with these. Um, I have too many slides because I kept trying to delete things. I'm like, no, they need to hear that. So uh, you'll have to help. Just cut, just cut me off. <laughs> um, so, oh, I should so I can go back. Um, so there's lots of great uh, co-authors on this project, and Renee is here, and Sylvia is here, and Gabby's here. So uh, make sure you connect with them too. Um, and there's some of our co-authors. We had some great student contractors, Abby McConnell. Any of you that kind of worked on this project or helped review things, uh, got to meet her and Sarah, and so they put so much effort into this. So a big shout out to those superstars. Um, so how did this get started? Uh, Sylvia came to me and said, can we use some social science to figure out what's going on with gender barriers? And I'm a social scientist with USGS, but I do human dimensions of Earth observations. So anything related to users and uses and value. Um, so I was able to incorporate within this project. Uh, so we had that kind of goal from Sylvia, figure this out was her guidance. Um, and so we went and tried to address these questions about how do women navigate barriers? Um, what are barriers to starting their career? Um, what are some of those factors that are incorporated into that? And then some potential solutions from the participants. So actually kind of in, you know, uh, listening and, and using what they say with those solutions. Uh, so we first started with subject matter experts. We did interviews to kind of make sure we were on track with our questions. So got lots of initial guidance. Uh, and then we did a deeper dive into these uh, three countries uh, randomly selected and and were able to um, interview women participants within those countries. Uh, we use these qualitative social science methods. And I bring this up because uh, lots of times there's surveys that go on out there and they're great because you can reach so many people, but you don't know what they're thinking past like what they checked in the box. So these qualitative approaches allow you to have these very in-depth sort of conversations. And then you look across the conversations for things that themes that are similar, but you also look for uh, unique components, things that we can learn and take to the next step. Uh, these are theoretical frameworks that are used in social science. I just threw up a whole bunch of different random ones. And I bring this up because lots of times we get this sort of question like, hey, could you give us the one answer that will help women in whatever discipline, right? And human behavior and human decision and decision making and how to help women is really complicated. Uh, so there's not this perfect fit uh, per individual, let a let alone across countries or within a discipline. So this, these are frameworks are just to show you how complicated that sort of concept is. So for this study, we did uh, intersectionality for our framework. Not gonna dive into that, um, but basically it's about the intersection of identities. Uh, identities are not additive. Many of you will kind of understand that, right? It's kind of this complicated meshing. It's not just adding different sort of um, maybe I'm a woman and I'm indigenous, or right? So all of those are mixed together. They're not added on top of each other. And then they're relational and socially constructed. So what did we find? Um, we have a publication out now that you can go look at. So I'm just gonna give you little hints here. Uh, so what we found that these uh, individuals, opportunities and forest carbon monitoring are affected by combined identities. Right, I don't have a pointer, but you can see here, is that working? Oh, maybe, yeah, a little bit. Uh, so we have this personal identity, right? So we have these identities, and this one is age. And then if you go across, what contributes to age, right? So it may be something perceived about their physical strength. And then we have these wonderful quotes from the women participants, and then the countries that they're from. Um, so all of that is in there. Um, we also have these structural factors that come into play, so things like education. And then we have these social constructions, not how women perceive themselves, but how they're perceived. So perhaps a woman is trying to go for a leadership position, 
and women may be perceived as not being good leaders, right, compared to men. So all of those factors come into play um, when women are trying to go through the porous carbon monitoring uh, job. Um, we have lots and lots of sort of great information from the women. We're working on another report that gives you a lot more detail about like their quotes and the things that they've incorporated. Um, so we have many areas where gender barriers come show up if you see that list on the left. And that was across countries, right? So education, hiring, work, promotions, workshops. Um, the scale of barriers was found at all different sort of wide ranging levels too across all countries. Uh, we did try to go, oh, the little things, um, blocking it, but we also tried to figure out things that are different within each country. Um, so we have some of those factors included. And then that intersectional component that I mentioned, right? So the intersectional com component is those combined identities. Uh, so perhaps you're a woman, but you're indigenous, or we le receive lots of comments about the knowledge of local women um, that wasn't being used uh, for decision making. Uh, so that came up quite a bit. Um, we asked them about their, uh, the participants, about the importance of women in future Earth observation. Um, so you can see, I think I'm trying to minimize that. I'm going to move it. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, so research have shown that women actually use the forest more than men. Uh, so if you involve women that have, may have better knowledge, right, the result will be more accurate. Uh, these are just uh, participant sort of quotes from what we asked them. Um, they thought that women would make a lot of different decisions um, if they were leaders. And if the women were equal to men, they'd have more access to financial resources. And then the chances of them being harassed or, or biased would diminish if they have that equal sort of leadership. Um, uh, this participant thought women would be more empathetic and more transparent in their decision making. Okay, hold on for this one. Um, so this one came up a lot, as you can see here. Uh, these are all the many, many quotes and comments about motherhood. Um, and if you probably went out and asked someone and said, you know, what's a barrier for women in forest carbon monitoring? I'm guessing they might say motherhood, right? And so we see this so often. But the, I think the important note about this from our participants is that even though it's been talked about forever, that there's not a lot of action that's being done for the barrier of motherhood. Um, so important to remember that action part. Um, and this just kind of shows the Im continued importance of gender inclusion. So there's lots of other sort of things to look at and some of these studies point out, right? If you have inclusion, you're likely to retain women more, um, better outcomes, lots of innovation, right? When you have these diverse teams, you have innovation, improving work, um, they won't have to Lots of women feel that they have to prove themselves, right? Work extra hard to get to that same sort of position. Um, they identify different problems. They think differently, um, more democratic decision-making. And this last one kind of always hits home with me for some reason. You need a super majority of women on a team for all the members of the team to speak an equal amount. I'm kind of quiet too, so that may be part of it, but. Um, so just, you know, some additional support for some of the things that we were finding in this study, too. So where are we headed? Um, so we have um, actually talked a lot, Angela, about a lot of women talked about leadership, right? Like they're in a certain position and really struggling with either going into leadership, um, what they need to do the difficulties once you're there. We've had a lot of women um, within these studies that talked about leaving leadership positions because they were so hostile. Um, so that's one of, a, one of a, a way that we could move forward with some of these different ideas. Um, talking to partic participants in other countries is important. We only talked to the three countries. Uh, the value of local and indigenous knowledge came up a lot, um, but Again, the comment related to that was there's not a lot of action related to that. It's just identified as a problem, but
but not really any way to move forward. Uh, we did this kind of ecosystem approach for this Landsat data ecosystem where, and we were thinking of looking at women in a network, like a social network analysis, right? So what are the connections, what are the lessons learned, how are communications being done? Um, it seems like for gender, from, from our participants, that sector might make a difference for solutions, that there could be solutions specific to, to certain sectors. So diving into that more, um, thinking about case studies and local presentations. A lot of women asked us to come back and talk to their organization about the findings. You know, lots of times you may go and have the study and then what happens, right? So how can we get that information back out at the local level? Um, and then we're working on an underserved, underrepresented project in Earth Observation, and we're expanding our team. So if anyone's interested in this, um, please, please reach out to me. Um, we're always looking to combine efforts on this. For some applied solutions, um, so one of the, you know, we have these kind of more complex, like how do we figure these things out sort of steps. And then we have some that could be started right away. And Sylvia with the Silver Carbon Program has already done this with one of their trainings where they made a training that was just for women, right? And so you can kind of see some of the previous tra a training photo and then one, this one up front, which was a recent one. And a lot of women asked for that, that we interviewed was like, it'd be great to have a training that was just women so I can have a, a larger voice, I can understand better. I don't have to feel like I don't, know everything. Um, and then we've also been working uh, with within the US with one of our uh, indigenous nations, the Navajo Nation, and we're working on a Landsat app that has um, time series of just the Landsat, land, or the Navajo Nation, and it's in English and Navajo. So there's a lot more complicated things that need to be done for that, but just starting with some of those simple steps can be helpful. And then uh, Monica, who's in the back of the room, uh, is a communication uh, expert with Silva Carbon, and she's done a great job of trying to get our information in a more sort of um, readable, useful, general public setting. Um, so she's created this website, and on the website there's different um, pages per country that she's pulled out some of the more applied like actions that could happen. And it links to the report that I've been mentioning. Uh, there's a QR code, so make sure you check that out too. I think that, I, I, I'm done. That's okay. it, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, are you next? All right, so we're gonna switch to Olivia, who's going to, you can't hear me. Oh, you can hear me. <laughs> We're going to switch to Olivia, who's going to talk about the Women and Forest Carbon Initiative. Okay, <laughs> hello everybody. <laughs> Um, my name is Olivia Freeman. I work for the U.S. Forest Service International Programs, and I help to manage and implement programs in Africa with silvicarbon. Uh, today, I am presenting on behalf of a much larger team on the Women in Forest Carbon Initiative Mentorship Program. And the I think Jennifer actually already kind of touched upon it, but the origins of this program really came from 
the recognition that there was gender disparity in program implementation. Like many of you, we have indicators we need to report on. And year after year, we were finding that uh, a lot of our trainings and people trained were predominantly men. And we tried to try different approaches, different years to change that. But I think what we kind of came to was the fact that a lot of our partnership partners um, and people who were in technical positions and team happened to be men, with notable exceptions. There are some amazing technical women out there, but the majority were men. And so um, we, at the global level for Silver Carbon, we've developed this mentorship program as one approach to start to try to address um, some of the barriers that Krista just very eloquently uh, presented. And then afterwards, you'll also hear from my colleague Tatiana on another program just focused in Central Africa. So um, the Women in Forest Carbon Initiative approach, again, USGS did the research study and Forest Service focused um, on this pilot mentorship program. Here's a little sneak peek of many people who have participated in the first phase. Um, and the main objections of, objectives of the program were to increase the engagement experience and visibility of women within the global silver carbon community and enhance and solidify institutional commitments to gender equity among silver carbon institutions. And in order to do so, um, it aimed to provide women students in silver carbon countries with professional experience, uh, learning opportunities, and mentorship focused on careers in the field of forest carbon monitoring, while also championing women um, in forest and carbon monitoring professionals in silver carbon countries, as well as in the US government, silver carbon agencies, and at the same time, building a network of women working on pursuing careers in forest and carbon monitoring and facilitating international exchange among professional counterparts. Um, so how this program worked was um, different country teams were put together. They included two in-country mentees, two in-country mentors, two US-based mentors, and a coach, which was a specialist in mentoring, professional development, and career coaching. So here is an example of the Vietnam team. Um, these teams worked together um, at the country level, but also engaged um, across uh, all of the different program participants um, and engaged in different professional development training and coaching, um, as well as the mentees engaged in specific research projects that they um, were able to develop um, and implement in coordination with both in-country and uh, U.S. government mentors. And so this is where the pilot program was implemented. Um, Cameroon, Democratic Republic of Congo, engagement from the U.S. and Vietnam. And you'll notice that there are no Latin American countries <laughs> in the program, um, but that was because our Latin American team decided um, in their specific context, they really wanted to focus on the networking piece. And so they did kind of a side initiative that really focused on developing a professional network of women in forest carbon. Um, so we didn't neglect this region. We just decided in this specific case there was a different approach. So these are some of the examples of the projects um, occurring or that have been undertaken in Cameroon, Vietnam, and DRC. And today we are very, very fortunate to have several people in the room who you'll be here presenting, but also their mentors. Um, so I'm going to stop there and really let them share with you in the panel session more about their experiences. Yeah. So thank you. And I forgot to mention, if you want to learn more about the program, Jennifer's managing it at the global level. <laughs> All right, let's see. If we can. Where did it go to the end? Is it the end? Thank you for giving me the floor. I am Tatiana Nana. I'm working as a climate technical advisor uh, for the US Forest Service in Central Africa. I'm very excited to speak today about the Central Africa Women Initiative. Uh, Wika. Is that Sorry, it says it's not sharing. One moment, please. OK, 
Okay, thank you. Uh, I am Tatiana Nana. I was saying that I'm very excited to speak today about the WICA program, the Central Africa Women Initiative for Climate Action. The U.S. Forest Service, uh, through its um, international program, Silver Carbon, uh, the Department of State Climate Fellow Program, the CARPE program, uh, supports Congo Basin countries in meeting their monitoring and uh, reporting obligations to the UNFCCC through direct uh, technical assistance and uh, training. Um, based on the um, observation that the overall involvement of women in uh, programs and positions related to sustainable management and climate change uh, response is low, the the, the program uh, aims at strengthening the capacities and enhance the involvement of Central Africa women in climate change process in general and carbon accounting in particular uh, through a one and a half year program, including national workshops, webinars on greenhouse gas accounting and international um, reporting frameworks, Diplo a diploma program on greenhouse gas MRV at the Greenhouse Gas Management Institute, participation at national and international conferences, internships in national and even international and regional institutions working in uh, climate change and related fields. Uh, within the framework of the program, we encourage national and regional networking among the weaker ladies and at the end of the each training cohort, we organize uh, closeout meetings for diploma presentation. The first phase of the WICA program started in early 2021 with uh, the recruitment of 104 fellows from Cameroon, DRC, Gabon, and ROC. The second phase started in um, May 2022 and it's still ongoing. And we extended the program to uh, the Central Africa Republic with the recruitment of 14 uh, fellows. And we are planning to start the third phase of the program in July 2023, focusing especially uh, in two countries, Equatorial Guinea and Central Africa Republic. So for the first phase, the outcomes are 104 women involved, trained, and um, among the 104 women, 35 completed uh, your Greenhouse Gas Management Institute diploma, 21 uh, completed also their internship in national institutions working on climate change issues, five participated at uh, the COP26 in Glasgow and supported their respective delegations. And um, also most of them uh, were participating in national greenhouse gas inventory processes in their uh, respective countries. This is our success story in uh, image. Um, uh, the, the, as the, my previous, uh, the previous speaker said, the ultimate goal of this program is for the fellows to find jobs. So this is the 10 ladies. Uh, there's one uh, <laughs> photo missing, but th this is the 10 ladies among the the 35 who uh, followed, um, the, who, com who completed the uh, GSG Management Institute program, who find jobs in their, na in their co uh, respective countries. So in the second phase of the program, 95 women were involved and were trained. Uh, 25 women are currently uh, taking their diploma courses uh, at the GSG Management Institute. Uh, 25 of the, the same 25 are currently um, following their internships in national institutions working on climate change. Um, and nine women participated in the, at the COP27 uh, in Sharma Sheikhs, supporting their respective national delegations. Another success story is that uh, among the ladies, eight of them uh, now are registered at the roster of experts of the UNFCCC. So if you want to have more information about the program, here are some links. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much.
so much, Tatiana and Olivia and Krista, for giving us the background of the detailed overview of those programs that, as I said earlier, have really been working together sort of to bring together different pieces of how we're taking a deliberate approach to getting more women involved in this field. At this point, we're going to take a bit of a stretch break. We're going to switch who's up here on the panel and bring up several of our program participants. So, um, Olivia, if I could ask you to switch the signs. Thank you for your patience while we get everybody included. So much better. Okay, we are so excited to have these panelists on the stage with us today. I'm actually going to ask you, before I start with the questions, we're just gonna go down the row, and if you could say your name and where you're from, your country, and the agency or organization that you're representing. So could we start with you? You have to turn the microphones on, yeah. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Chen Thanh Du, I'm from Vietnam and I'm a mentee of um, Women in Forest Carbon Initiative. Hello everyone, my name is Cao Thi Thinh Nguyen, I uh, come from Vietnam, I'm living in Hanoi and uh, working uh, at uh, Phoebe. Yeah, that's all, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, hello everyone, and uh, nice to meet you. And uh, my name is Nguyen Thị Hoa, and uh, you can call me Hoa as well. And I'm a final year student at Vietnam National University of Forestry, and I'm from Vietnam. Uh, thank you. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Nguyen Thị Ngọc Lâm. I'm from Vietnam. I uh, am working at Forest Inventory and Planning Institute. I'm a mentor of Vietnam, uh, WFCI. Yes, uh, uh, this time to zone uh, WFCI is a uh, valuable time 
for me and uh, Vietnam team. Uh, thank you. Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Endale Sophie Patience. I'm from Cameroon and I'm a PhD student in University of Yaoundé One in the Department of Plant Biology. And I have the opportunity to participate in the program Women in Forest Carbon Initiative. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Kadjo Fedjo Henri Sonia. I am a mentee in the WFC program. I am from Cameroon. I'm also a PhD student at the University of Yaoundé One, specialty agroclimatology. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Ariane Mwamba from Cameroon. I have participated in the Women Initiative in Climate Action in Cameroon. I am still a PhD student in University of Yaoundé One in biology plant. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Anaïk Modinga, I'm a Gabonese and uh, I'm participating to the WICA program. Thank you. It's so wonderful to have you all here on the stage with us today. I believe that if you want to listen in French to your colleagues while they're speaking, the interpreters are still translating. So if you want to put the headsets back on when it's not your turn, you can, if that makes things easier. Okay, I'm going to start off. We have some questions for the panelists to learn about their experience in the programs. And the first question I'm going to ask is, can you tell us why you personally wanted to get involved in climate action or carbon measurement and what makes you passionate about this area of work? And I'm going to ask our colleague, too, to be our first respondent. Um, for me, um, actually, I grew up in a rural mountainous area of Vietnam. And 90% uh, of humans uh, in my hometown is ethnic minorities. And 70% of uh, human daily life depend on forests. So, however, uh, in 2008, uh, a huge flood destroyed my hometown, taking away all the sediment, arrived fields, and cattle. We had food shortage for months, and children like me cannot go to school. Um, the forest upstream have been wasted uh, due to the uh, soil erosion, um, illegal loggings, and um, farming activities and eventually causing this flood. Um, be, uh, because of this events, uh, it motivated me to study and protect and um, share with my communities about uh, the role of forest to prevent um, the disaster. So uh, while studying in um, studying and working in the universities, um, I take part in uh, many uh, research and uh, uh, volunteers uh, programs. Um, we, uh, uh, at that time, I started to uh, participate in uh, these uh, areas, and um, because uh, it helped me to think uh, how I can contribute to the forest that was in my community. Thank you so much. And Lam, we would like to ask you the same question. What made you personally want to get involved in this field? Okay, I'm so nervous. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, uh, carbon dioxide emission uh, mainly stems from human activity uh, that are posing a global challenge uh, in the fight against climate change. Uh, forestry is no exception for, uh, to this struggle. And um, for a long time, forests have always uh, played an extremely important role in uh, protecting environment and contributing um, to the sustainable socio-economic 
development for each country. In uh, the context of increasingly severe climate change uh, with unpredictable consequences, uh, forests are the savior in maintaining the source of life and uh, the ability to protect people against um, natural fluctuation and natural disaster as well as uh, in, um, mitigating uh, climate change and its negative impacts. Uh, the World Meteorological Organization has long recognized that women are more vulnerable to uh, the effects of climate change than men because they uh, make up the majority of uh, the world poor and depend more heavily on the natural resources. Um, as a woman and an engineer working in forestry, I am delighted to uh, devour my efforts toward this uh, struggle against climate change for a better future. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you so much. The next question that I would like to ask is prior to participating in the Women in Climate Action or the Women and Forest Carbon Initiative, how did you feel about getting involved in research or technical work related to greenhouse gas or carbon monitoring? Did it seem like something you'd be able to accomplish? Why or why not? And let's see, I would like to ask Huyen to be our first respondent to this question. Yes. Uh... I'm a mentor of Vietnam WSCI. Uh, before 19, uh, 2019, uh, uh, I uh, was an uh, editor of um, agriculture public sing house. Uh, then I um, transferred to the FIPI. Uh, so I, um, I have a little experience about um, carbon monitoring. Yes, uh, before I uh, enjoyed uh, WFCI, I had, uh, um, I, I, um, I, uh, it, equipped, uh, it equipped me uh, with um, professional experience for work, uh, including uh, global uh, land uh, ex um, exploration and analysis uh, overview. Uh, GIS, uh, RS application in the sharing uh, world, a, a for, forest carbon monitoring. Uh, we uh, participate in the international workshop on uh, application uh, of remote sensing uh, technology to build an only warning system for the forest loss and chain land use purple um, in Da Nang City uh, and uh, um, listen to experts uh, from other countries uh, discuss and introduce the early uh, warning system uh, measure for um, deforestation and uh, change the land use. Uh, all of this are uh, very useful for my work. Yes, that all. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's grateful to. It's great to hear these concrete examples of how hard it was to get into the field before you had some concrete experience. Um, next, let's see. Hoa, would you like to answer the same question? How did you feel about getting involved in this field before you had the opportunity to participate in this program? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, a nice question. And 
uh, in May 2021, I uh, was introduced by the faculty of the university to join the WFCI program. And uh, at that time, I don't have more experience about the few cook or uh, ha have a little uh, knowledge about the greenhouse gas or climate change. Uh, and uh, yes, and uh, when I uh, enjoy the uh, when I join the WFCI program, um, the program teach me or uh, give me a lot of lesson, a lot of uh, experience. Uh, yes, uh, so I know I want to tell you some activities in the program. Uh, in uh, April 2022, we have a field trip in uh, the West Nian province of Vietnam uh, with project application of Mantu short uh, remote sensing to estimate the biomass in the evergreen forest. And uh, in uh, December 2022, we have the, uh, we participate in the uh, international workshop early warning system. And uh, now we have the opportunity to in, uh, attend the uh, international workshop in uh, Rome, Italy. Uh, so now you can see I have a lot of chance to improve my shell and I can, and can have a lot of lesson to improve my shell and to learn more about the in-country women and international women. Uh, yes. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much. And yeah, it's really important. I think everybody in this room knows that hands-on experience is a really important part of learning whatever career we're going to be in. So having programs that are set up to bring that experience in is really important. The next question I'd like to ask you is, what challenges or barriers have you personally encountered as you try to advance in your studies or career related to forestry, climate change, or greenhouse gas monitoring? And first, I'd like to ask Sophie Patience to respond to this. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. The main challenge for me was to review the, the idea that I, w I had on forestry because I was just limited on the simple fact that uh, forestry was just counting, measuring, and identifying tree. And through this program, I learned another part of forestry like um, learning the the tree cover monitoring through uh, GIS and remote sensing. The other challenge for me is that uh, being a beginner in the field, it's not easy for me to have a place in the organization and institution who, uh, with, who deal uh, with uh, climate change and forestry because they often prefer people who are already experts in the field. Thank you. Yeah, I will share that I also, at one point, thought that forestry was just measuring trees. And now I know it's so many more things. All right. Um, Let's see, and Sophia, Sonia, would you also like to answer that question? Yes, thank you, Jennifer, for giving me the floor. Uh, for me, the main barrier was the fact that I was not have sufficient knowledge and experience in the domain, and that made very difficult um, my insertion in the social professional domain. So it was not easy to just switch from geography, especially agroclimatology to forestry. And nowadays, thanks for US Forest Services uh, and thanks for the Women in Forest Carbon Initiative program, 
I have learned a lot and I do not get only knowledge, but also experience and it's more, it's easy it's and possible for me to be, to have insurance and I can just go to, go to opportunity, which is related to, uh, which will require expertise in climate change with more confidence. Thank you. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, as we can all see, there are a lot of different things that come into play when we're all trying to gain confidence in a new career um, and a lot of barriers that can get in the way. The next question I'd like to ask is actually about these two programs. Um, what specifically was the most useful aspect of the Women in Climate Action or the Women and Forest Carbon Initiative program for you? And please describe that and why specifically it was beneficial. Um, Ariane, would you like to go first? Thank you for giving me the floor. For me, the most useful aspect of the WICAP program was the internship. Because during the WICAP program, the girls were encouraged to take internship in the national institution who creates climate change. It was so useful for me because at the end of my internship, I have signed a contract with the National Authority of Climate Change in my country, which is ONAC. That is why I think that internship was so beneficial for me. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing those insights on how the internship was beneficial. And next, um, Anayak, am I pronouncing that right? Would you like to answer the same question? Okay, thank you for giving me the floor. So as part of the wake up program, the most important aspects for me were first the GHG, Management Institute Diploma Program, and also the opportunity to participate in person and thus support our national delegations uh, during um, international discussion on uh, climate negotiation, uh, such as uh, the COP26, uh, the African Climate Week, the One Forest Summit. Uh, so basically, this allows me to extend my uh, professional network with uh, experts on climate change issues. Thank you. Thank you all. And I have one more question for you, which any of you can answer. Someone can volunteer. Um, if there were some young school women sitting in the room today, maybe 14 or 15 years old, what encouraging words would you offer to them or how would you encourage them to get involved in this field? Would anybody like to take a stab at that question? Yes, I'd be happy to repeat the question. If there were young women, schoolgirls, maybe 14 or 15 years old, sitting in the audience, what advice would you offer them today? Or what words would you say to encourage them in their career, or even as they're finishing school? I can take it, okay. Um, at this stage, if I could just advise a young sister, is that um, climate change sciences is like a never end process and it's change. So everyone have a role to play in the fight against climate change. So everyone must be feel, must feel concerned about. So if the intent to to start this long process, they need to be 
patient, they need to be humble and they need to be very, very strong because for me, this characteristic may be her drive if they want to succeed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ariane. Okay, thank you. Something that I would like to add to what uh, Sonia have said is that we don't have to say that we have finished school. If you want to improve yourself, you have to learn every day to read any time, anywhere, everything that you can see, which is important for you in your career or your domain. You have to, to learn every day. You don't see that school, uh, you, have, you have finished with school. You, you learn every day and learn a lot. Thank you. It is indeed an ongoing process. Do we have one more answer? Please go ahead. Yes. <clears throat> um, I think climate change uh, is one of the most um, serious uh, challenge, challenging uh, um, our world uh, today. Um, our planet is uh, experiencing. Uh, signific significant and um, and uh, a similar climate change um, that beginning of, over the um, uh, country uh, ago um, we we have a, a, a duty to uh, to take action to uh, prevent the climate from uh, um, getting worse. Um, I, I think uh, let's fight uh, against climate change around the world. Yes, it's uh, my uh, idea. Yes. Thank you so much for those encouraging words. We actually have a question coming in in the chat. Not a question. Ah, more of a comment. Okay, so just to repeat that for the microphone, a comment from the chat is thanking FAO for this initiative and this session today and asking when the next trainings are. So we can respond to that afterwards. Um, I would like at this point to take questions from the audience and I see a hand up already. Um, Sarah, oh, and the microphone, perfect. Um, first, I want to uh, express my appreciation um, for our male colleagues sitting with us in the room. And despite your presence here, we have a what I would call a super, super majority of women. We are super. <laughs> um, and, and my question is, um, what can we do to make this an issue for everyone and not just women? So if any of the panelists would like to answer that question, but I would also include those of us who were here on the stage earlier, if you'd like to respond. And in the spirit of acknowledging the male colleagues in the room, I would like to acknowledge Renee Seaway, who was really instrumental in starting the Women in Climate Action Program. <laughs> Anybody have a response to Sarah's questions? Let's not let that be a rhetorical question. Uh, please, I, I want more uh, precision. Uh, is it that the climate change question concerns everyone or just the program? I want you to precise the question. Um, oh, repeat the question? 
Yes. Or clarify the question. Clarify the question. Yes. So the fact that we have so many women here in the room and so few men, and we appreciate our, our male colleagues being here, I wanna be clear about that. Um, and and they, we've all chosen to come here. How do we turn this into enough of an issue for everyone that um, we have more male colleagues in the room with us saying that it's an issue not just for women, but also for them. It's an issue for everyone to have more gender equity. Mm, I could have that um, concerning the, this initiative, for example, concerning the Women Forest Carbon Initiative, if you want to, you can just add the number of uh, mentee, for example, and also, it, uh, I don't. I think that the the communication or the you don't have enough communication about the different program, and if we, we can just work on it, it could just be we could have more people uh, who show interest in it, and also uh, if. I could just downscaling for the, at the national level, for example. Um, the government needs to work with international organizations very closely, for example, to, to just introduce or insist uh, on the fact that uh, climate change is a global problem and everyone needs to bring his contribution. So um, if at the bottom, uh, we can just uh, uh, show that interest for every woman and also uh, insist on the fact that women also can, <laughs> if I can say that. So I think in this way, we can have some change. Thank you. Thank you so much for that answer. And I see another question in the back of the room. Not really a question, thank you. I think I'm just trying to make a contribution to a question. And if I understand you very well, you mean um, in a way that we can have more men participating here, even though it's women program. Okay, for me, um, this is what I understand. I just feel like uh, when it comes to mentorship, if we really want to get the men involved, because this is women in forestry, and the men will feel like, okay, it's women thing, you guys should do your thing. So I feel if we really want to get the men involved, we should also try to assign, uh, assign women, young women, to men to mentor them in the field. And when you when they try to invest in women, they want to see how far they go. And I feel they will want to be here to actually get some acknowledgement. Like, yeah, these are my mentees. This is the impact of what I have done. And that's where they'll feel carried along. Because it's somehow, you know, when you say women in forest, you're like, okay, go and do your thing. And they try to. But if they get more involved, like the action is there, and they feel like, yeah, my impact is here, they will want to participate. Thank you very much. Other questions or comments from the room, perhaps questions for our panelists? I was just gonna follow up on that same question, which is uh, some of the meetings I've been to have been trying to raise awareness and emphasize the importance. There's a lot of competing interests, but this session as is one of the sort of main um events or sessions can also kind of bring more awareness to to some of these issues the questions from the room or maybe panelists do you have any questions for the audience Janet. I, I want to thank everybody for their participation today. This has been really, really nice. And um, it's just been lovely to hear from all of you. And I'm thinking about as you um, get through your next stages of your career, 
Um, I wasn't quite sure, but is the WFCI and the WICA program, are they set up so that um, each of you get an opportunity to be a mentor in for future cohorts? Is that something that's um, that hap it's happening or could be um, an idea to, to think about maybe? I, I don't know. That's a great question. Would any of you on the panel like to respond to the idea of being a mentor? I can respond as well. Yeah, um, so it's uh, actually something which was uh, one of the recommendations from the first week of cohort to enable, uh, so they actually formulated that recommendation that they would like to continuously play a role as we bring in new generations of uh, WICA fellows. So um, we've been doing that to a certain extent, especially during the, uh, there are so-called in-country workshops. So we always have the uh, uh, WICA fellows of the, pre the previous cohort come in and also share their experiences. But I think um, now that we are having uh, WICA fellows and we've seen mentees already in professional positions, I think even for future WIFC cohorts, we could actually have former WIFC mentees as mentors to new cohorts. So I think uh, there is a wide range of possibilities there that we could definitely exploit. Thanks. And I'll briefly add that the the WIFC program, the Women in Forest Carbon Initiative, um, is sort of at the end of its first iteration and we're beginning to frame the second iteration. So we're still figuring out exactly what that looks like, but we definitely do want to keep people involved. All right, let's take one last question from the audience here. I, thank you. It was um, inspiring. It was awesome to hear all of you. Um, I was just curious, um, like in, I'm from the United States, and probably the percent of women in, at universities now is 55 or 60 percent. Um, so, like, things look good for you in the future. And I was just curious um, if that, I don't know what's, what the trends are internationally. I was just curious in your countries. Um, in terms of education in the next generation, what the ratios are like. Yeah, thanks for that question, Paul. To clarify the question, in each of your countries, approximately what is the percentage of women in universities? So if you look at the university classes, what percentage of those classes are women? Yeah, that's an, a good addition to the question, actually, that Paul just mentioned. Does it depend on the topic? So, for example, maybe literature might be more women, forestry might be fewer women, or maybe forestry is more women and nobody wants to study literature anymore. Okay, in my university, especially in my, de my department, uh, we have uh, most women in forestry uh, courses because the the women have uh, take uh, that courses like uh, as a challenge because they observe that um, we have uh, in the past we have we have uh, most men in the in the in the courses so, but in the um, literature department also we have most the most the women women in in my country uh, prefer literature yes they prefer literature now i can say in my country we have most the the, the, the we have most uh, women in the university. Thank you. Thank you so much. And remind us what country you were from. Uh, my country is Cameroon. Thank you. Um, did I see any? Yes, please. Okay. Something that I would like to add is that 
the problem is not education, because when you see the, the percentage in Cameroon, you can see that the, the woman is, the percentage of women who, who study is low, is higher than the percentage of uh, men in, in any domain or sector in the education. But when we see climate, climate change, we have a problem because the, the woman is the person who, who is more affected by the climate change because she is the person who, who have to do anything for their family, in, in their school, in their home, in anywhere, uh, which is uh, something that man cannot, man can do it, but it is not, we can say, their job. Because in their, con in their country, we had something that which is specifically for the, the girl or for the woman. The, something that I would like to say is that in education, we don't have the problem for this, but it is in the practice, in the, in the, in the world, in the, wo in the, in the job, in other sides, but in, not in, in education. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. That, that is a really important point, that sometimes what we see in the educational system doesn't flow up um, all the way to leadership in leadership or policy making in general. So that's another area to think about things. All right, I think with that, we are right at time. And I want to give our panelists here another huge round of applause, not only for speaking, well, first of all, not only for traveling all the way here to be on the panel today, and not only for speaking today, but for your accomplishments in your program this past year or two. Before we go away, two more things. Um, we have certificates for each of you that if I could ask uh, Associate Chief Coleman to come up, we will hand those out to you right now before you go away. And then of course we would like to do a group photo, so don't run away. I should clarify, these certificates are specifically for the women in forest carbon participants. So, Ange Sonia, maybe you could walk over to her, yes. That's okay, I'll bring it over to you. The next, oh, we have a runner. Yes. Sophie Patience. Oh no. Next is to Ms. Huyen. Next is to Ms. Lam. Uh -huh. Next is to Ms. Hoa. And last but not least to Ms. Tu.
And that's not in any way to say that our women in climate action participants are less. It just so happened that the sort of graduation or culmination of our Washington DC based program coincided with this trip and we were able to distribute the certificates today. So thank you so much. And again, let's um, do a round of applause and then we'll gather for a photo. So if I could have everyone who is on the early panel come up here and stand, perhaps those of you who are already here can stay seated and we can have the other people come and just stand behind you. Just so everyone knows, um, we will be having gelato and sparkling wine in the atrium after this once before people start disappearing and then there will be drinks on the top floor at 6, 6 p.m. 6 p.m. <laughs> and, um, and anyone going on the city tour tomorrow, in case someone hasn't told you, wear comfortable shoes because it's a little bit of walking. All right, thanks.